Does the world, matter in motion, have meaning? Is it open to God's writing a few lines? Annie Dillard approaches these questions with the arts rather than the sciences as her companions because novelists and poets, she says, interpret the great world itself. However, science and secularization have hushed the bushes and gagged the rocks. The direction of recent history, she says, is towards desacralization, the unhinging of materials from meaning. Is the universe a matter of significance? Her final line of the book is also her final answer, and it is, I'm sorry, I do not know. Well, we've come a long way from the Belgic Confession, which has no qualm speaking about the book of nature authored by God. The universe, it says, is before our eyes like a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are letters. But for many today, the universe is a closed book, indecipherable even. After reviewing recent proposals representing the state of the art of the theology science conversation, Nicholas Saunders concludes that it's no real exaggeration to state that contemporary theology is in crisis. Why? Because almost every Christian doctrine depends on our being able to give a coherent account of God's action in the world. And because, in Saunders' opinion, our best accounts veer on the incoherent. According to the late Oxford theologian, Maurice Wiles, if we're to do justice to modern science and the laws of nature, we have to refrain from claiming any effective causation on the part of God in relation to particular occurrences. That's a pretty severe restriction under which to do theology, and it requires the remaking of Christian doctrine. And Wiles himself obligingly proposes a radical makeover of theology. He wants us to think in terms of God's one master act of world-making. He admits it's a highly revisionist thesis, inasmuch as we now have to translate biblical reports of particular divine action into statements of continuous divine activity, an activity that comes to light only when human wills are open to its influence. Wiles thinks that Jesus is the incarnation and revelation of God because he is completely open to the one divine purpose, not my will, but yours be done. Well, the stakes are as high as they can be because contra Wiles, the coherence and truth of the biblical story utterly depends on God's bringing about particular real world events. Israel's exodus from Egypt, Jesus' resurrection from the grave. To remake Christian doctrine, to conform to the criterion of modern science, is to choke the good news that God has done something for us and our salvation. But the only thing those who tuck theology into Procrustean bed can say is, good night Christianity. So this year's creation project theme, Divine Action, is vital to what we could call the gospel project. If special divine action is not the continual sustaining and upholding of the universe, but action that makes a difference by bringing about events that would not have otherwise taken place, how should we conceive it in the world as now described by the sciences? This presentation will have four parts. I begin by reviewing arguments against divine intervention the major stumbling block is identifying the causal joint that explains how something spiritual, like God, can affect changes in something material, like nature. I'll then give a brief survey of three non-interventionist accounts of divine action and conclude that all three are false starts. The third part retrieves the notion of personal agency thereby refusing to let the scientific law, thou shalt not intervene, set the terms of the conversation. And then finally, I'll examine speaking as the privileged form of personal action, 
and explore the possibilities of viewing the God-world relation in terms of a communicative bond rather than a causal joint. Henry Staub thinks the book of nature metaphor somewhat misleading. He says, nature is hardly a completed manuscript in which each word is statically interlocked with every other. Nature is rather a dynamic process resembling a discourse now being spoken and revealing at every turn the meanings and intentions of a living speaker. I agree which is why I like to think of the world in theatrical terms. Calvin spoke of the world as a theater of God's glory, and a theater is a place to behold happenings and doings, events and actions. So think of the world as a theater of divine operations. The challenge is to specify the kind of operations involved. Now to speak of special divine action, means that God has not simply created the world stage, but he steps onto it, as it were, to do things. In Alvin Plantinga's words, God's action constitutes a theater or setting for free actions on the part of human beings and other persons, principalities, angels, Satan and his minions, whatever. God sets the stage for such free action by causing a world of regularity and predictability but he causes only some of the collapse outcomes, leaving it to free persons to cause the rest. Well, there's apocalyptic theater wherever God reveals himself in space and time, in, say, a burning bush, a pillar of fire, a thundercloud. An apocalypsis is an unveiling, a pulling back of the curtain that divides heaven and earth. And biblical apocalyptic, treats the cosmic battle taking place between the evil powers and principalities and the incoming missions from the kingdom of God. God's mighty acts, like Jesus' resurrection and second coming, take center stage in what I'm calling apocalyptic theater. But the world of modern science and its operations is altogether different. It's an experimental theater in which events happen because of this worldly causes that can be analyzed, isolated, formulated mathematically and predicted. The stage on this view is a place not for meaningful stories, motion pictures, but for repetitive causal sequences determined by the laws of nature, matter in motion. Now, in ancient Greek drama, the gods often appeared at the end of a play to tie up loose ends. They typically made a spectacular entrance being lowered to the level of the stage by a large lever called a machine, hence the term deus ex machina. And this is a graphic image of what bothers many theologians and scientists about special divine action, the idea that God mechanically enters into the great theater of the world to alter supernaturally the natural course of worldly events. You see, deus machina, represents everything its critics dislike about the traditional picture of special divine action insofar as it involves divine intervention. Now the etymology of intervene is instructive. It means to come, venire, between, enter, and it's the idea that God comes between a natural cause and its natural effect. To intervene is thus to interfere with the normal outcome of physical processes, either by breaking in from the outside or by fiddling with the laws of nature. The standard view among scientists and many modern theologians like Wiles is that intervention is anathema. Now for years, members of the Divine Action Project, a collaborative research program co-sponsored by the Vatican Observatory and the Berkeley California Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, has been trying to find ways to account for divine action without relying on divine intervention. And we'll consider some of these ways in a moment. I want now simply to list some of the reasons why that they give for not viewing the world as a place where God stages interventions. So first, they worry that for God to violate his own created structures suggests that he's either incompetent 
or an unfaithful creator. God would not create an orderly world, they say, in which it was impossible for the creator to act without violating the created structures of order. Second, they're reluctant to endorse the, what they take to be a crudely anthropomorphic principle of a God who acts inconsistently and arbitrarily now and then, but not as much as he should given the prevalence of evil and suffering. As one of the members of the Divine Action Project, George Ellis puts it, if God can heal the sick or alter the weather, why does he not do so more often to assuage my toothache as well as the evils of Auschwitz. Third, there's a concern that special divine action renders or diminishes God to be an agent among many agents, a cause among many causes, pulling the creator down to the level of creation. And what's interesting about those first three objections is that they're all theological rather than scientific. But the fourth one is properly scientific. The worry is that if nature does not behave with law-like regularity, then science wouldn't even get off the ground insofar as science commits us to understanding events as occurring within an unbroken continuum of natural causes. Now, in the great experimental theater of the world, the biggest challenge to understanding special divine action is locating the point where divine power meets creaturely effect. How does God's transcendent causality interact with the physical particles and forces that comprise the material world? And how can we account for divine action without falling into divine interventionism? That's the problem the Divine Action Project sets out to resolve. So the game's afoot. Everybody's looking for gaps in the causal order where God can act without violating natural laws. The challenge is to specify the nature of that causal joint, that theoretical space wherein divine intention meets physical reality in such a way that the laws of nature are not undermined. Well, my primary concern is for the world as a theater of God's word, in particular for dialogical interaction with human beings. Because the storyline of scripture depends on and highlights precisely this aspect. The emphasis throughout scripture is on divine speech acts, where God calls things into existence, the things that did not exist, Romans 4, 17. Where God orders creation by his fiats, let there be, and his commands, thou shalt not. God cuts covenants. He declares people righteous, and so forth. You see, what matters is deus dixit, not deus ex machina. Divine interjection, not divine intervention. Now, to be sure, an interjection is a kind of linguistic intervention. It introduces into the world, not simply information, but a new kind of force that Isaac Newton hadn't even dreamt of, illocutionary force, what an agent does in speaking. Now, whereas divine intervention pertains to causality and inanimate things, divine interjection features intentionality and other persons. And unlike Weil's notion of God's one master act, divine interjection reminds us that God adapts his activity to the individuality of each person and situation. God enters into relationships with individuals and even on occasion addresses, addresses them by name, Samuel. Now in many dramas, dialogue carries the action. And this seems to be the case with scripture which is largely the story of what happens when the word of the Lord comes to certain people, to Adam and Eve, the patriarchs, Moses and the prophets, the apostles, and so on. In fact, as David Powell has shown, in the book of Acts, the word of God becomes the central character that steals the show inasmuch as Luke is concerned to assert its world-conquering power by demonstrating its ability to increase and multiply the people of God. 
we should expect nothing less of a word that is living and active. Now, before we make a fresh start with divine interjection, I want briefly to examine the state of the art in the theology science discussion by reviewing three ways in which participants in the Divine Action Project have tried to develop alternatives to divine intervention. In general, the non-interventionist's goal is to avoid both deism, where God does nothing, and interventionism by finding a place where God can act without violating the laws of nature. In short, they're looking for a causal joint that is flexible enough for God to act without interfering in deterministic physics. And all three of the theories we'll look at agree that God does not intervene in the sense of acting to break into creation from the outside. Rather, they'll suggest that God acts in and through the natural processes themselves. So divine action is apparently an inside job. In classical physics, the fundamental laws were deterministic, and they applied that nature is deterministic, a closed causal system of forces rigidly determining the motion of matter. So where in the world can, act, can God act then without violating the fundamental laws of physics? Easy where the laws of physics don't apply, in the twilight zone of quantum mechanics. <laughs> At least on the Copenhagen interpretation that Niels Bohr and uh, Werner Heisenberger have put forward, the indeterminacy of quantum events is not merely epistemological, but ontological. In other words, there's a gap that we don't have to worry about eventually being filled by our new knowledge of the laws of how nature works. We solve the problem of the causal joint then by doing away with causality at the quantum level. Now Robert John Russell, founder and director of the Center for Theology in the Natural Sciences, says that God can act together with nature to bring about all events at the quantum level. And that these events at the quantum level give rise to what he calls the classical world, the world we live in. But the remaining question is whether or how divine action on the quantum level translates into divine sovereignty into the world in which we live and move and have our being. Now a second place where God can act without intervening in the laws of nature is in those complex dynamic systems described by chaos theory. God here acts in microwaves that eventually produce mega results, like the proverbial butterfly that flaps its wings in China and causes a hurricane in Kansas. John Polkinghorne of Cambridge locates the causal joint in chaotic systems because, he says, their unpredictability makes room for divine maneuver. The sheer complexity of natural systems suggests that the physical world is open in its process, that the future is not a spelling out of what was implicit in the past. There's real openness. The third non-interventionist model is unique in that it no longer regards the bottom-up causality that characterizes physics as the paradigm of material reality. The new picture views the universe as hierarchically stratified with the higher levels, like a biological cell, depending on a lower level, like atoms, but you're not able to reduce the behavior of the cell to the behavior of atoms. Something new emerges at a higher level. Each level then relies on lower levels for its existence but cannot be explained in terms of those lower levels and presses those lower levels into its own service. The result then is two-way causality, bottom up and top down, or from part to whole or whole to part, as in an ecosystem. Now this is still a non-interventionist model. It can't accommodate biblical accounts of explicit miracles or mighty acts of God but some, nevertheless, think it has potential because the way wholes affect the parts that constitute them 
often doesn't depend upon energy input. It doesn't require a push. It rather requires information input. This is the right direction. And that opens up the possibility that something other than physical forces can make a difference in the world. Things like holistic organizing principles and maybe human intentions. So by definition, top-down causes are generated at a higher ontological level than that at which they are realized through an effective cause. And Arthur Peacock, one of the leading proponents of this idea, reasons that if God interacts with the world system as a whole, then he could exercise influence on the parts from the top down without abrogating the laws that apply on their respective levels. Call it trickle-down Trinitarian economics. <laughs> so let me say a little bit more about this role of information. While many scientists continue to think of nature in terms of matter and energy, others, uh, particularly biologists, say that information is the primary entity from which physical reality is built. Think, for example, of the DNA code that uh, instructs cells to make proteins, the stuff of life. Today, the cell is seen as a kind of supercomputer an information processing and replicating system of extraordinary fidelity. The interesting question for our purpose, though, is where does information come from? Does it really have a causal power? And is information conserved like energy? And if so, where? Well, Peacock sees an analogy with the way in which the mind has causal effects at the level of the body. And if this is true, that would mean that there are other kinds of causes besides the elemental forces studied by physics. And yet, any input of information requires some input of matter or energy, doesn't it? Even if it's minimal, which is why Peacock himself says that this represents the ultimate level of the causal joint conundrum. The way thoughts in the mind result in movements of the body remains at present as scientifically inexplicable as God's action in the world. Now there's time only to list some of the problems with these three non-interventionist models. First, if the gaps that house the causal joints are epistemological rather than ontological, they may eventually be filled in and we're back to either deism or interventionism. So, while causal joints are now legal in Illinois, there's still a problem. <laughs> Second, these non-interventionalist models lack a criterion for distinguishing God's action from natural events. And what troubles me I think in particular, is that they're unable to account for the way the Bible depicts God as acting. It's implausible, to me at least, to think God's mighty acts, as reported in Scripture, can be explained in terms of manipulating electrons or butterfly wings. And then third, all three of these models cede supreme authority to science by looking for the undetermined places in the physical world where God is allowed to act without being charged with breaking and entering. So the question is whether Protestant theologians, having wrested supreme authority from Rome and returned it to the scriptures, where it belongs, should now bow the knee to the new magisterium of science. Fourth, the scientific picture wrongly posits competition between divine action and natural processes as if God were one cause among causes. And this leads to another kind of incompatibilism, namely the idea that either God or physical processes produce effects, but not both. And this assumption, I think, mistakenly confuses physics with metaphysics. So strictly speaking, I wanna say that special divine action is at worst non-scientific, but not unscientific. 
So in order to do justice to the biblical accounts of divine action, we need to break out of the causal straitjacket that follows from the assumption that God is one cause among many who has to bend over clockwards in order not to interfere with the laws of nature. The picture of a closed causal continuum not only makes divine action difficult to conceive, but it also problematizes the way we think about our own actions. According to Francis Crick, the molecular biologist with uh, James Watson, they proposed the double helix structure of DNA. According to Crick, you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. The notion that my inner life is the result of external influences and sensations, and that I can't produce a single thought or action out of my own resources, is deeply intuitive and a little bit insulting. I'm sorry, but on this point, Crick is a crock. <laughs> Our new picture then needs a new frame. Call it a theological theology of nature, a Trinitarian naturalism. I think Plantinga is right. The real conflict is not between science and theology, it's between science and naturalism, that is, materialist metaphysics. And the irony is that the non interventionist counts we've just surveyed all presuppose a scientistic naturalism that reduces reality to matter and motion. And it's precisely that misleading metaphysical picture that generates the problem of the causal joint. Remember David Hume's definition of a miracle as a violation of a natural law? Well, what are really the laws of nature? Do they really govern nature? Or are they only statements that summarize the regularities we perceive in nature? Are the laws of nature prescriptive or descriptive? Take, for example, the law of the conservation of energy, which states that the total energy of an isolated system remains constant. The law stipulates that what happens in closed systems, like the grandfather clock in my living room that keeps time by using weights to pull down a uh, that uh, make a pendulum go back and forth and strike the hour, if I happen to reach into that grandfather's clock and stop it, have I violated a law? Or have I simply introduced a new factor into the equation? I think the latter. Every law of nature you see includes an implicit rider which acknowledges that the addition of new factors will change the effect from what the law predicts. And I think this exposes the real issue. It's not determinism or intervention. The question is whether the universe is a closed, isolated system. I can't say this enough. Materialistic naturalism is a metaphysical, not a scientific position. Physics tells us what happens when particular forces are taken into account it doesn't tell us what happens when influences unaccounted for by physics are present. One alternative to reductionist materialism is to think about nature theologically from the get-go. Irenaeus, the church father, insists that God is at home in the world as its creator, so he has no need to engage in breaking and entering. It's precisely God's transcendence over creation that enables him to be immediately present to it. In Thomas Aquinas' words, a thing is whatever it operates, but God operates in all things, according to Isaiah 26, 12. Lord, all that we have accomplished, you have done for us. Another Thomas, uh, Wynandy, explains, the God who is wholly other than creation is present and active within creation precisely as the holy other, not as one cause among causes, but as the primary cause. Something like this was also the theme of John Webster's 2007 concert lectures given here at Trinity. 
Webster says that it's because God is perfect and has life in himself as the Father, Son, and Spirit, it's because he is perfect that he can be present in our world. So, does God have to break into the world from the outside? No. I'm suggesting he doesn't because he's everywhere and at all times immediately present, actively sustaining and engaging the world because that world was created to be open to his influence from the beginning. Those who are looking for causal joints are therefore seeking scientific answers to theological questions. And here's the key point. If we reframe the picture of God and the world in explicitly theological terms, we see that God and natural processes are not in competition. Divine interaction with nature is part of what it means to be natural. So to think theologically about the laws of nature means that we see them as expressions of God's care. To think theologically about divine action means adopting a Trinitarian habit of mind. If we remember the patristic adage that everything God does is the work of all three persons, the Father and his two hands, the Son and Spirit. So Trinitarian naturalism stands in stark contrast to scientistic naturalism. What I'm saying, what I'm trying to claim is that to be properly natural is to be under God's care. So what led to the search for these non-interventionist models was a metaphysical picture that held moderns captive. The fear of an anthropomorphism that would reduce God to the level of the human joined forces with the acceptance of a scientific reductionism that displaced God from the world, and the result was the notion of God, to put the notion of God as agent into metaphysical limbo, if not purgatory. So I want now to return to my original suggestion that the natural world is a theater for God's action, to the praise of his glory. I believe that a robust account of the agency of God frees him from metaphysical purgatory and enables us to speak of personalist paradise regained. We begin by distinguishing actions from events. Events in nature are occurrences linked in unbroken causal chains of varying length. Think, for example, of chemical or nuclear chain reactions. Events are happenings that one can more or less predict by invoking the appropriate causal laws. But when we ascribe actions to someone, we're doing more than reporting on physical processes. If you ask me what I'm doing, I may say, I'm watering the garden. But I'd probably not say, I'm making synaptic connections in my brain or contracting muscles in my body even though those descriptions are true on one level. We've all experienced involuntary knee-jerk reactions. That is not yet an action in the way I mean it. To act means to take an initiative, to put something in motion intentionally. We describe a series of events, we ascribe action to agents. And when we do, when we begin to ascribe actions to agents, we find ourselves telling a story, a story that doesn't cite causal laws, but rather gives reasons and motivations for what people do. In short, we begin to talk about persons rather than things. Acting, someone has said, is the creating of history. Now, to be sure, humans are made up of atoms, chemicals, genes, we have bodies that enable us to do things that make a difference in the physical world. And so, in one sense, the human is a microcosm of all the levels of created reality put together. Our beliefs, desires, and values distinguish us from other kinds of creatures, as does our faith, hope, and love. We're created in the image of God. We have the ability for intelligent fellowship with God. Tertullian defined a person as one who speaks and acts. And I think this corresponds to everyday experience. This is me, talking, acting. The key conceptual move is to view personhood 
as a non-reducible, basic, ontologically fundamental, elemental fact of life. Not to admit persons into your metaphysics is to fall prey to an unnecessary and unbiblical reductionism. I'm not asking you to believe in fairies, as J.M. Barry does and Peter Pan, but if you believe in persons, clap your hands. It's a sad day for humanity. <laughs> the next step is to insist that human beings are personal agents who can take initiatives and thereby intervene in what would be without their presence an otherwise closed causal web of events. John McMurray believes we get a better grasp on what it is to be a person by starting not with Descartes' I think, but with I do. The final step is to relate what I'm saying about personal agency to scientific accounts of the world. Strictly speaking, I don't think it's right to say that persons break the laws of nature when they act. Rather, persons put them to use, put these laws into motion. Acts don't fit into a pre-existing causal order, says Frank Kirkpatrick. Instead, acts preside over, supervene upon, and utilize the causal order through which they transmit the intentions of the agent who originates them. So please note, agents don't intervene in the causal order as much as they supervene over it. They co-opt, they superintend natural processes to achieve their intended aim. Well, the really final step is to relate all this to divine action. But if human agent initiated action per se is not a metaphysical absurdity, divine action shouldn't be either. If humans can put causal infrastructures into motion, why can't God? William Alston adds a further specification. He says, what is essential to acting is not bodily movement, God doesn't have a body, only that an agent with knowledge and purposes wills or intends to produce certain effects in the pursuit of those purposes. And again, this is less intervening than supervening. It's not that divine action has to fit, much less break into the laws of nature. It's rather that God as a personal agent simply deploys lower level processes of nature as we do as agents to realize his intentions. It could be then, if this is right, that the search for a causal joint turns out to be as pointless as the quest for the historical Jesus. Now everything I've said to this point has been argued well by others. What follows is an attempt to advance the discussion a bit by focusing on one form of agency in particular, communicative agency. I'm not the first to treat speaking as a form of divine action, but few have done so in the context of theology and science. It's a project ripe for harvest for three reasons. First, because unless God has at some point made himself known in intelligible speech, we would not be able to say what he is up to in the world. Divine interjection disambiguates divine intervention. Speaking is also what distinguishes the true God of Israel from the dumb idols of other nations. False gods like dead men tell no tales. The second, much of what scripture reports God doing involves speech acts and a number of things, naming, promising, commanding, exhorting, require a communicative medium, medium like language. And then thirdly, communicative action is particularly suited to divine human interaction because speech is not the kind of action that by itself deprives, deprives another of one's freedom. Or to put it differently, significant self-communication that comes to us from others is never experienced as a mere intervention from the outside. What gets touched by communicative action is not something bodily only, your eardrum, but something deeper. You can touch a person's heart through communicative action. 
God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. Job 37, verse 5. And this is my thesis. Many of the mighty acts God does in the world involve putting not matter but morphemes into motion. A morpheme is the smallest particle of meaning, either a word or a word element. So the word impassibility is composed of three morphemes, im, passable, and itty, designating a quality. So Daniel Dennett, no friend to Christianity, is fascinated by words. He says, we're as dependent on words as we are on vitamin C. Words are the lifeblood of cultural evolution. He admits that we don't yet know how to identify brain tokens of words by their physical properties. So strictly speaking, brain reading isn't possible. And as to words themselves, Dennett says, they have no mass, no energy, no chemical composition. But my, do they pack a wallop. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Talk about energy. So by divine interjection, I mean the act of God putting a certain sequence of morphemes into motion in order to bring about a change in the world. An interjection is an interruptive word, as in the word of the Lord came to, an expression that occurs about a hundred times in the Old Testament and is arguably at the heart of the Dabar project. Usually, the word of the Lord comes to a person saying something, which is to say doing something. Andrew Shedd says, the word of God is the subject of the narrative framework that structures the book of Jeremiah. And we follow it, the word of God, on a journey of destruction and rebuilding that spans the earth. Mark Gignelliot says something similar about Isaiah. He says, in the second half of Isaiah, the central dramatic figure is not the human prophet, but the word of God, a word, he says, whose effect and power continue beyond the earthly existence of prophets and apostles. You may be wondering, how can God, who is spirit, produce language? Well, William Alston notes that using vocal cords is not essential to speaking. That's the way humans do it, sure. But God has other ways of communicating messages. Alston says, if God wills, and hence brings it about, that certain thoughts form in my mind, together with the conviction that these thoughts constitute his message to me at this moment, that is as full-blooded a case of direct divine action in the world as the production of audible voices. It is but a vulgar prejudice, he says, to suppose that decibel levels or number of observers is a measure of the divine activity level. Can morphemes in motion produce macroscopic effects? Yes, they can. In putting morphemes into motion, God performs a variety of communicative acts, interdictions, introductions, interrogations. God establishes laws, initiates relationships. He imparts wisdom all by putting morphemes in motion. Daniel 2 provides an interesting example of how divine communicative action produces geopolitical effects. God sends a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, who's desperate to understand what it means. But no one can show its interpretation to the king except the gods, he says, whose dwelling is not with flesh. But then God reveals the meaning to Daniel, who's able to make it known to the king. Daniel tells the king what the thoughts of his own mind mean. <laughs> and in return, Nebuchadnezzar makes him ruler over the province of Babylon. Or consider Hezekiah's plight when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, invaded Judah and confronted him with the political reality that Egypt would be unable to make good on its promise of support. And so the mocking question is asked, on what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? This whole episode is a war of words, and the question is whose words will ultimately prevail and prove true? And Isaiah tells Hezekiah not to be afraid of Sennacherib's words because those words mock the living God, and God will put morphemes in motion 
or Isaiah says something like that. Uh, to be precise, he says, God will make Sennacherib hear a rumor that will prompt him to return to Assyria where he'll be killed. Well, I can't say I've received dreams from God myself, but I am often on the receiving end of certain ideas. Can science explain where ideas, especially the creative ones, come from? I show up, my, I show up at my desk, I read scripture, I pray, and then I wait for the morphemes to wash over me, and I thank God when they do. The divine interjection involves more than the inputting of information. DNA molecules do that. What God wants to communicate is something of his own light and life, which is to say, his son and spirit. Jonathan Edwards held that God created the world so that he could communicate himself. And this happens most fully only to intelligent beings. What God communicates is more than impersonal bits of information. In Edwards' words, the communication of himself to their understandings is his glory. And the communication of himself with respect to their wills is their happiness. He also says, the Son communicates knowledge, the Spirit communicates both love and joy, and Edwards describes this divine action as conversation. By conversation, he says, I mean intelligent beings expressing their minds to each other in words or other significations equivalent. Divine communication is, I'm suggesting, the paradigmatic mode of divine action in the world. And again, by communication, I mean more than transmitting bits of information. God's speech acts carry different kinds of illocutionary force and, thanks to the Spirit, persuasive power, which explains why God's word does not return to him empty, but accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent, Isaiah 55, 11. And again, note, this divine communicative activity is the work of all three persons. In Calvin's words, to the Father, is attributed the beginning of activity, to the Son the ordered disposition of all things, but to the Spirit is assigned the power and efficacy of that activity. And so maybe now we're in a better position to appreciate the peculiar force of divine interjection. The difference God makes in the world doesn't interfere with the laws of nature, but it brings about a properly communicative effect a particular response of created intelligence. I don't want us to overlook that one of the most important ways in which God acts in the world is by prompting humans to do things. Remember Sennacherib. To be sure, often we act by reflex, but often we act for good reason, and God can insinuate the end in our deliberations. What the Father is ultimately doing in the world through the Son and Spirit is preparing a people with whom to share his own life, to be his own treasured possession. Hebrews 8.10, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. What comes to the fore in passages like that is not a causal, but a communicative joint, a triune communicative joint. The Father speaks what he wants to share with creatures through the Son and Spirit, the content and dynamism, respectively, of divine communicative action. And the intended effect of all this action is communion. Now, I haven't explained how God causes things to happen in nature, even little things, like stirring the water at the pool of Bethesda. And some may find my ideas about divine interjection disappointing, a cop-out even. Well, I may have taken the road less traveled, but it's a steep climb, more difficult, because you can change things in the natural world by exerting tiny bursts of force, but to change a person takes time and huge amounts of energy, as every parent knows. But this is precisely what God does as our Father when he puts morphemes in motion. He implants certain morphemes, 
the gospel in people's minds and hearts and impresses on them through the internal witness of the Spirit the excellence of this message. Divine interjection awakens faith. Elsewhere, I've described the effectual call as a special communicative form of causal effect. Luther says, the words of Christ not only have the power to teach, but also to put things in motion. And Luther, Luther was in awe of the power of God's word to create, yes, you should read his commentary on Genesis, it's all about the power of the word of God, but also the power of the word to recreate sinners. And with Paul, Luther regarded the conversion of the wicked, something brought about by the word, as a new work of creation, every bit as impressive as the Big Bang. Jonathan Edwards, similarly, viewed the creation of faith by the word as a crucial line of evidence in favor of God's action, which he called a supernatural work, as crucial line of evidence that God is active in our world in an age of science. Christian conversion is the result of divine interjection. Paul in Ephesians 2.1, you he made alive. Marilyn Robinson describes faith as an act of God effecting human consciousness, a quality of mind. And I think this echoes the second Helvetic confession, which says that God teaches us by his word, out, uh, teaches us inwardly by his word, outwardly through human teachers. Second, in addition to awakening faith, divine interjection forms the human spirit. And this, too, is a way of bringing about real-world changes. How does divine communicative activity change the human heart? Well, according to Claude Shannon, the father of modern communication theory, information involves the transmission of intelligence. William Dembski explains that at its core, information is about the impartation of patterns. Keep that definition of information in mind and now listen to Ezekiel 36. A new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see, what I think God is ultimately seeking to impart to us through his interjections, through putting morphemes in motion, is nothing less than the pattern of Christ divine intelligence and love incarnate. Paul says, but we have the mind of Christ. So speaking of the power of words, the late New Testament scholar Donald Jewell tells a story about how a teenager changed his reading of Mark's gospel with one statement. It was during a Bible study he was leading with these teens. And Jewell had just drawn a connection between the heavens being torn open at Jesus' baptism and the tearing of the temple curtain at Jesus' death. He said, the tearing means that in Jesus, God has removed the barrier affording us access. Then the teenager, and I like to think that he had acne, the teenager said, that's not what the passage means. It isn't that we have access to God, it's that God has access to us. God is here among us on the loose. The boy's words cut Jewel to the quick. Jewel writes, I knew he was right, and something invaded my imagination that has reshaped my experience of Mark's gospel, the Christian message, God, and the world. The actual reading of the story of Jesus' baptism did something within the world on this side of the biblical page. Words were let loose in the imaginations of a small class and their teacher that tore gaping holes in their imagination. Through ordinary words, God intruded into the intimate realm of our imagination and began reshaping the world. So where and in what manner does God speak today? The supreme instance of divine communication, of course, is Jesus Christ, 
the divine interjection made flesh. And that continues indirectly through the words that witness to him. Indeed, John McIntyre, a Scottish theologian, suggests that after Pentecost, a new mode of communication appeared on the scene through which God now acts. We call it the sermon. Now, your homiletics classes may not have described preaching as setting morphemes into motion. But consider, according to the Second Helvetic Confession, preaching is a form of the Word of God. Heinrich Bullinger, its author, comes close to describing preaching as a means of participating in God's triune communicative action. For God himself alone, by sending his Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds of men, doth open our hearts, persuade our minds, and cause us with all our heart to believe that which we, by his word and teaching, have learned to believe. The Father sends the word of the Son and the power of the Spirit to open, persuade, and convict through this peculiar kind of causality I'm calling communicative. This may suggest that we've been looking for divine action in the wrong place. It's not in the fire or in the thunderstorm or in the chaos or the quirkiness of the quark. It's rather in the pulpit, which Herman Melville famously compares in Moby Dick to the front of a ship. Yes, the world's a ship in its passage out, and the pulpit is its prow. So I hope you'll find this encouraging. Ministers of the gospel are not like those who vainly speak into the air. Rather, they are the instrumental means of special divine action. The ministry of the gospel makes all the difference in the world because it communicates the word that is ever living and active. So, parse your verbs correctly and put your morphemes into motion to the glory of our God and Savior. Thank you.